are currently looking into reinforcement learning as opposed to supervised learning. And as I explained last time, reinforcement learning is probably the technique that will take us to real artificial intelligence one day. So the idea in reinforcement learning is that you are not told what is the correct answer or what is the correct strategy. Instead, the neural network explores many different strategies and the only thing it gets as feedback is some kind of reward uh, that tells it whether the strategy was more or less successful. So that is very good because then you can start actually solving new problems, uh, problems that you haven't solved before. You don't know the good strategies. You're only able to tell what is a good solution versus a bad solution. So I want to start by reminding you of the basic setup that we are looking at uh, right now. It's one particular reinforcement learning technique that is called policy gradient. It's say one of the two big classes of reinforcement learning. And the setup is shown here. You have some kind of agent that is interacting with an environment. The environment is the world around the agent. The agent makes some observations. Uh, through the observations, it learns something about the state of the environment. And then a policy or a strategy consists in mapping that state into an action. So it asks the question, what do I want to do next if I observe this particular state? What should I do next? And then it executes this action, which will also involve changing the state of the environment usually. You move around some object, for example. Then you will do the next observation, which will confirm that the state of the environment has changed. You map that state again into an action and so on and so on. And so you go along until there's a cutoff. Maybe you have a set a total time that is uh, allowed for executing the strategy or maybe there is some goal that is defined and once you have reached this goal, then uh, you, you finish. And so um, there could be several different ways of implementing such a policy. You could think of a deterministic mapping from state to action. And actually, in most cases, uh, at the end of the learning process, this is also the result. But before you are there, it's better to have a probabilistic policy for many reasons. But the most important reason in this context is that probabilities are continuous, and then you can change them only a little bit in each step of the training. And so here, the policy, therefore, is not a deterministic mapping, but rather it's a probability, a conditional probability of a certain action given a state S. So if you know the state, then you have a set of probabilities for the various actions that you could take in the next step. Commonly, this policy is denoted by pi. So pi stands for probability in this case, not the number pi. And then it comes with a subscript theta, which is to indicate that this policy has been parametrized and you can change the parameters and thereby you can adapt the policy. And in most cases that we will be dealing with, the policy is actually uh, represented by a neural network. So then theta is all the parameters of the neural network, the weights and biases. And so that is uh, depicted here. So the input of the neural network would be the observed state and the output would be the probabilities of the various actions. So in this example shown here, there would be three different discrete actions and therefore there are three output neurons that will give us the probabilities for having these three different actions. Okay, so now let me just move ahead. We went through a, a very, very simple example where the policy actually did not even depend on the state. But now I want to discuss with you a more interesting example. So um, imagine again we have a little robot, or I will call it a walker, uh, that can walk and thereby change its position. In this case, uh, the steps it can take are either zero or one. So either it stays where it is, that is a step of zero, or it moves ahead one pixel. And so it can move along and the trajectory, the position as a function of time could look like the one shown here. 
And now to define the game, we will say that there's a specific target site here indicated in yellow and that the uh, reward it gets will be plus one for each time step it uh, remains on the target site. So in this case, these were four time steps, so the total return, as we call it, the sum of all rewards would be four in this example. And the goal, of course, as always, is to increase the return as far as possible to make this return maximum. And you can all guess what is the optimal strategy. So at first, you should be moving as fast as possible, one step at a time towards the target site, and then you should remain there forever until the uh, total time is run out. Now, how can you do that? Well, the, in this case, there is an observation. So the observation is whether you are on the target site or not. If you are on the target site, you will know. And that, of course, is enough to give you uh, the possibility to perform this optimal strategy. You could modify this game in various other ways. Um, you could always retain the target site on the same spot, but never reveal uh, whether you are on the target site at any given point in time. Then uh, the optimal strategy would have to be inferred indirectly in the sense that, of course, in the trajectories where you stayed on the target site, uh, you get a higher reward, otherwise you get a lower reward, and thereby indirectly by training many, many trajectories, always retaining the same location of the target site, you could also figure out the best strategy. But in this case, uh, the observation tells you whether you're on the target site, and the only thing the neural network or the, the reinforcement learning has to figure out is that it should actually stay on this target site because it doesn't know. It will only learn indirectly by looking at the overall reward. Okay. So um, we will go through the code in a moment, but first I want to um, set the stage for the neural network. So in the previous example where we had a random walker, um, there was not even an input. So the policy did not depend on the state, did not depend on any observation. And the output was just the two probabilities of moving up or down. And we did this uh, in a very simple way. We didn't even need a neural network. We essentially made something like a, yeah, well, one parameter probability. And so we could solve everything analytically. So here is a more general case, and therefore we want to start using a neural network. And as always, the input of the neural network will be the observation and the output will be these probabilities for the various actions. And so the neural network that I propose uh, is shown here. Uh, it only has one input neuron, which encodes the observed state. And in this case, the observed state is just zero or one. So it will be one whenever we are on the target site. Maybe there's a little label attached to the target site or the color of this target site looks different. So uh, the agent will be able to tell that it is on the target site. Or at least it's able to tell that it is on a special site. It doesn't yet know what's the meaning of this. It will only infer the meaning of this by later looking at the reward. Okay, and then the output neurons, there are two of them because we have two actions. Action equals zero would mean stay. Action equals one would mean move. Uh, and of course, they represent a probability distribution. So later we will use something like a softmax, which guarantees that we have a normalized probability distribution. And then I thought uh, to make it slightly um, more intelligent, I will need a hidden layer. So that's why there is a hidden layer. In this case, I indicate two neurons. And so this whole neural network implements the policy. Given a state, it will determine what are the probabilities for the two different actions. And the theta here is really just the weights for all the connections in the neural network. So that's my policy. I have represented my policy via a neural network. And here, of course, this is still very simple. Yeah? So I only need one neuron for the state, and I only need two neurons for my two actions. But this is really the same they are using in very, very advanced settings. So in that case, maybe the input would be a full image, and I would have as many neurons as there are pixels in the image. Uh, the output would be many more actions. Could be anything, but we will see an example where the output neurons determine where you place a stone in a, on a game board. And then, of course, you also can have many more hidden layers to make the neural network more powerful. But this is the principle. So this is really the principle. 
So now I want to take you again through the steps that you would have to implement to make policy gradient work. Once you have decided that you want to do policy gradient and that um, you want to use a neural network. So the first thing is to play one game, to play one run of the game, to play, to get one single trajectory. How do you do that? Well, um, you do it time step by time step. So here's what happens in one single time step. You execute the action, so you move up or down, for example. And you record the observation that is the new state that you observe. Then you apply the neural network to the state and as output it will give you the probabilities, the new probabilities for various actions. So that was the purpose of the neural network. And then from these probabilities you should obtain the action. So here you have to throw dice, you have to implement a random number generator and according to these probabilities it should select one of the actions. And then once you have selected the action you just repeat, you execute the action, you record the observation, you feed it into the neural network, you get the action probabilities, and from these probabilities you obtain the next action. So you can see how I can repeat this one after the other for all the time steps, for all the 100 time steps, and then maybe my game is finished. Yeah, so then my trajectory has been completed. And so I have obtained one trajectory. If I run the whole thing again, even without changing the policy, I will get a different trajectory because we're talking about probabilities. And so you can imagine that you do many of these trajectories. Maybe you do a full batch of trajectories. Maybe you do 20 trajectories uh, simultaneously. Okay, so now we know how to get one trajectory, but we don't yet know how to update our policy or how, how the whole reinforcement learning works. And so that I show here. So the blue box again is what we just discussed on the previous slide to do one trajectory. Or in reality, I write here a full batch of trajectories. It's just much more efficient if you do this simultaneously. Then for each of these trajectories, you obtain the overall sum of rewards. That is the overall return for the trajectory. So it's a single number. For each of these trajectories, you get a single number and it's big. if it's bigger, then it's better. And then comes the crucial step. You want to change your neural network. You want to change your policy. You want to make it more likely to give you higher reward. And you do that by applying this policy gradient training, which in words is very easy. Uh, I told you in the beginning, it just means it enhances the probabilities for all the actions in a high return trajectory. So if you really got a high return for this trajectory, you know somehow the actions must have been good, at least most of them and you try to enhance their probabilities. Each of these actions was selected from among several possible actions given the observed state, and you would want to push up the probability to get this particular action the next time you run through the process. Okay, but how do you do this actually? How do you implement this, this last step? Because that's the non-trivial step. And so there's a little trick how to implement this. Again, here on the left-hand side, I just remind you of how we set up things with a neural network. The input is the state. The output are the neurons that display the different action probabilities. And therefore, you have encoded uh, the policy. So probability of action given state. Now, I'm interested in implementing the policy gradient strategy, uh, which we discussed in the beginning, which was essentially you want, to, you want to write down the expected return and you want to do policy, you want to do gradient ascent on this expected return. And we found out, I don't know whether I have the slide here, maybe if you give me a minute I can find it for you. Uh, we found out that this involves the gradient of the logarithm of these, um, of these uh, probabilities, so maybe here. So you want to implement this. So you want to change your theta, your parameters, according to the gradient of the expected return. And that really amounts to, for each uh, time step, taking the gradient of the logarithm of the probability and multiplying by the return for this full trajectory. And if you then sample over all time steps and sample over many trajectories, 
uh, that uh, should be the gradient. Uh, that is the direction you want to take your parameters. So now how to implement this? It's a little bit tricky. In principle, this return is something like a cost function, or you could say a negative cost function because higher return is better. But how do we actually implement this in something like Keras? And so this is the little trick that I will show you now. Um, so the little trick consists in making use of something that we mentioned before, namely a particular cost function. It's called the categorical cross entropy. Um, it's called an entropy because, well, it involves probabilities and it, and it involves the logarithm of a probability just like the entropy. And um, here there is a specific nice application of this categorical cross entropy which will directly give you this policy gradient method. So let's say I define a cost function which is minus the sum over all actions, um, some probability of this action times the logarithm of this probability that I obtain from my neural network for this particular action. And so now I claim I can do the following. This P of A probability, usually if you did supervised learning, uh, you would prescribe this. I don't know from where, maybe you would uh, observe a human expert doing moves and thereby get a probability distribution over taking different actions from these observations. And then uh, trying to minimize this cost function would mean to try to mimic what the human expert does. So in the end, your policy from the neural network would match as close as possible these probabilities obtained from observing the expert. But that's not quite what we want to do here. Rather, we want to do something else. For the one action that was taken in this trajectory, in this particular trajectory, we will set this P of A to R, to the total return for the trajectory. And for all other actions that we could have taken but didn't take, we will set P of A to zero. Now, that means here in the sum over A, only one term will survive, namely the one term for the action that we did actually take. And it would now be a little a small exercise for you to convince yourself that if I now try to do gradient descent on this cost function in this manner that we know before, this will exactly give us the gradient ascent for this expected return. It will exactly implement the policy gradient. Essentially, this is because, you see, if I take the gradient of this cost function with respect to theta, what I get is the gradient of this logarithm of the probability. And by having defined my P of A in the way shown here, it will only be the probability for the action that I actually did take in this trajectory. So everything is fine. Everything is exactly as it should be for the policy gradient. And so that's nice because now we can use the standard tools of Keras uh, to actually implement this policy gradient trick. Okay. So uh, here I show it uh, in some more concrete detail. So let's say I went through many trajectories, a full batch of trajectories. Each of these trajectories consists of many time steps, so I really encountered many, many different states. And so let's say these are capital N states. So that would be the total number of trajectories times the number of time steps in each trajectory. And so actually I have not only capital N recorded states, but I also have capital N recorded actions that I took when I encountered those states. Yeah, so I record the whole movie, so to speak. I know what I did. And so now I claim the following. Let's set the cate categorical cross entropy as our cost function, which is easy enough to do in Keras. It's just one line. And then I claim the following single line implements policy gradient. So we tell Keras to train on a batch of samples given the observed inputs and the desired outputs. But now what are my observed inputs? Well, this is an array of n times the state size, yeah? because for each of these n time steps that I have recorded, the input to the neural network 
was of a certain size. In our case, it will just be one neuron, but it could be more complicated. It could be a full image. So these are the inputs, but what are the outputs? <laughs> well, for each of the n uh, states that I went through, the output of the neural network is, of course, um, the number of actions you can have. This is the number of output neurons. Yeah? And so now, how do I set these desired outputs? Well, I just told you on the slide before, the desired output nominally is this P of A distribution. But this P of A distribution is very simple. Only one of these entries will be non-zero, namely the one for the action that was taken. So if I, among these many n states, I take the one that is a number j, I will set its desired output for the action that was taken equal to r, and r is the return for that trajectory. So this is exactly implementing this line, p of a equals r. Yeah? So for all the actions in this particular trajectory whose return was r, I will do this. I will set uh, the desired output for that particular action to R. Okay, and that's it. So <laughs> if you have set the categorical cross entropy and have set this as the desired output, you will automatically update your neural network to enhance the probabilities of these actions that were taken. And the enhancement will be greater for the higher return uh, simply um, because the return is in here or the you could also say the, the, since the return sits here, it will scale the cost function, so the higher return gets more weight. Okay. Is there an immediate question about the slide? Otherwise, I would go actually show you the actual program. Okay, so then let's switch uh, to the program. It really helps to see this at least once in action. So let me go there. Try to make this larger. Okay. So I import the usual libraries. This is nothing special. And then I initialize my network. And just to remind you what we are usually doing, um, here I start a new neural network in the usual way in Keras. Then I add the first layer, which is a dense layer with two neurons, and I tell it that the, in, the number of input neurons is just one in our case, so very simple. And then I add another layer, which is already the output layer. It also has two neurons because, remember, we have two actions, staying at the same site or moving. So this is, the, this is this walker on target example. And the activation function is actually a softmax function, so it's not, uh, not trivial. Um, okay, let me see. Maybe I should also have added an activation function here. Um, okay. And then the final thing I want to point out is that um, I also set the loss function or the cost function to this categorical cross entropy. So that was the real trick. Uh, yes, please. Does it matter how my hidden layer looks like? Or could I choose several hidden layers to say remix? Ah, yeah, so no, you, you can play around with this. Obviously, if you have more hidden layers uh, and more neurons, your network can become more powerful. Um, but you also should not overdo it as usual because then training may be slower if you have a really big neural network and maybe it's not even needed. And also the evaluation is uh, slower, obviously, because it needs more time to compute. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Um, so this is one thing, to in, um, initialize the network in the correct way. But as we know by now, since the f these frameworks like Keras do all the work for you, this is only a few lines, so basically it's almost nothing. Um, what you need in any reinforcement learning program is you need a routine that does 
the actual action. Yeah? So, so that would be here. In our case, it will be very simple. You will see it's a few lines. But in, in more complicated scenarios, it may be a routine that given your action, it simulates the motion of physical objects and how they behave when you implemented this action and how things change and what is the observation you obtain after this. Yeah? So it can, it can include all the physics, all the interesting part will be encoded here. But in our case, it's very simple. So you give it an action, or more precisely, I wrote actions in plural, which just means I will have a full batch. I always will work on a full batch of trajectories in parallel, and so al also I have a full vector of actions, uh, one for each of these trajectories. Yeah. So it will be a vector of size, batch size, and each of these actions will be either zero or one in our particular example. And so then, what I will do is, I have another variable, let's say a global variable, that encodes the walker positions. Again, it's an array because for each of the trajectories I need to record the walker position. And I just add to that the actions, which just means I move the corresponding walker by one step if the action was one, or I let it stay there if the action was zero. So that's very simple. So, so this one line would have to be replaced by something really sophisticated in, in the general setting, which does the physics simulation, knows how the objects start moving. Or there are examples where this one line is replaced by the game, uh, by the code of a computer game that calculates how all the enemy players are moving and so on. Yeah. And then that's one thing, applying the action, but uh, also we need a new observation because the observation or the state will become input for the next time step for our neural network. And that happens here as the return value of this uh, function. And what it returns, this looks like a lengthy formula, but what I really do is just uh, for each of these tra trajectories, I check whether my walker is on the target site. If yes, I return a one. If it's not on the target site, I return a zero. So uh, you can download this code, and if you think a little bit more about it, this is all that I'm doing here. So that's the observation. And again, in more complicated scenarios, instead of just returning the single number, I could return a full image. This image might represent a 3D representation of what a camera on my robot is seeing, for example. But the concept will always be as simple as shown here. So you implement the actions, you do whatever it takes to time evolve the environment, um, and then you return the next observation. Okay. So then if we want to go ahead and um, run many trajectories, I need to initialize a batch of trajectories. So I will put all the walker positions to zero. This is done here in the second line. And for each of these different walkers, for each of these tr different trajectories, I will pick a random target position yeah, because I want to train on many different random target positions. Um, the target position should not be fixed. And that's what happens in the first line. So between zero and some value that I call target max, I will select random integer numbers. They represent the target position. And for each trajectory, the target position will be different. Okay. So now, um, yeah, there's one important extra step. You know the neural network uh, returns to me a set of probabilities for the actions. But now how do I convert that into an actual action, which is just an integer number, zero or one? Well, I have to draw random variables. And so if you give me a probability to obtain the random variable being one, say 0.7, you say with probability 0.7, I should get a one. How do I implement this actually? And there's a very simple trick that is known for a very long time, of course. You just draw a random variable, a continuous random variable between zero and one that can take any continuous value between zero and one with equal probability. So it's just a uniform distribution. And then you check whether this 
continuous value is less than the probability that you told me, your 0.7. Yeah? If yes, return 1. If no, return 0. If you think about it, this will make sure that I will return a 1 with probability 0.7. If you had told me 0.9, then I would check whether my continuously, uh, my, my, uh, my, my drawn continuous random variable is less than 0.9, and only then I would return 1. And if you think about it, uh, this will happen in 0.9 uh, fraction of the cases. So it's a very simple way to generate this. Uh, there's also ways to properly extend this to the case if you have more than one action. Then, of course, you have a set of probabilities and you need a bit to be a bit more careful, but it's not so difficult. And here, the only uh, little trick was to implement this in a way that it also works if I'm not only dealing with a single trajectory, but if I have a full batch of trajectories at once. So there's a little bit of array syntax tricks in there. Okay. But this was just drawing the actions according to the probabilities that are given to me. And now we come to the heart of the whole uh, thing. You know that um, when we did supervised learning, we had to initialize the network and we had to have a routine that um, produces all the training examples, the inputs and the outputs. And that was basically it. Then we can immediately call this routine, get all the training samples, and train there, and, and it would, was done. Here we have to have this extra step because we're dealing with reinforcement learning, so it's something more sophisticated, uh, where we actually implement the kind of steps that I told you about before. So we have to run the trajectories, we have to record the returns, and we have to um, implement the training. And, and that is done here. Uh, in a function that I call do epoch, so one step of the training, if you like. I don't go through all the details, but I will explain the most important pieces. Yeah? So normally the actions are obtained from the action probabilities that the network gives you, but of course for the first time step, it maybe it doesn't have any observation yet. You cannot apply the neural network, so I just take random actions for the for the first. Uh, uh, time step in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. And then I go through all the possible time steps. And now I apply the actions that I have obtained previously. In this first step, they were random, but later they will have been obtained by the neural network. I apply these actions. And again, that was the function where all the interesting simulation happens and where, as a return, we get the observations, so you observe the new state. Then I want to take these observations and feed them into the neural network in order to obtain the next action probabilities. So how do I do that? Well, I have to reshape my array a little bit, so that's, this is what happens here. But essentially, I'm feeding all these observations into my neural network, again, as a full batch. And what I obtain are the probabilities. So again, this will be an array of size batch size times two because I have two actions, so two probabilities. And now I will somehow skip this particular step. That's, a, that's something extra. And I will draw, uh, uh, call your attention to this line. Um, given these probabilities, I will draw random actions, and these will be my new actions. So the probabilities are continuous variables, but the actions are simply 0 or 1 integers. And again, because I'm dealing with a batch, uh, there will be one of these for each trajectory. And then um, I just record, I take a record of what I'm doing. This is just because, first of all, I want to be able to plot things as they are uh, updating during training. And also, for my reinforcement learning step, which I will discuss in a moment, I need to keep a record of all the actions and observations, uh, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do the reinforcement learning. Okay. So now, after, after I've simulated, so now I went through all the time steps. After I've um, simulated all the time steps, 
I can calculate a final reward. How do I do that? Well, for each trajectory, this is the rules of our game, I have to check how many time steps was I sitting on the target site. This, this is the rules of our particular game. In other games, you have different rules, of course. Yeah? And so, uh, this is what happens in this line. I, I don't go through the detail, but uh, basically, I, um, um, I take a difference between the target and the walker, and if this difference is zero, then this tells me, oh, I'm on the right side. And then um, I do a little bit of algebra in order to figure out the total number of time steps that I was sitting on the correct side. So for each of the trajectories in the batch, I will get, um, I will get this, what I call final reward. That would be the capital R, the capital R for each of these trajectories. And so now comes the, the final big step where we want to do the actual policy gradient step, the reinforcement learning. And so to get this, um, what I showed you on the slide was uh, essentially I only need this, um, for all the possible states and observations, I need um, an array that has the input to the neural network and another array that has the, what we call desired output, which was really just this probability P of A that was set to the return. So uh, this is what I'm doing here. I call it big input array that contains all, for all the states that I encountered during these many trajectories, during all the time steps, I, I, I record the state. And then um, I also start producing an array that will record what I call the desired output. Here I call it action one hots. So I call it like that because uh, as I told you before, only the one particular action that was already, that was actually taken in that time step, it will have a non-zero value. But the non-zero value is not simply one. The non-zero value is um, equal, oh, sorry, is equal to the reward uh, for this particular trajectory, uh, to the re total return for this particular re uh, trajectory. So in these few lines, what happens is I'm preparing myself to take this policy gradient step because I've recorded all the observations and all the states and I have produced uh, the proper desired output. And then it's just a matter of a single line to tell Keras to train using these inputs and outputs. Yeah. So this is what I also had on the slide, only on the slide it looked a little bit easier because here I have to do a little bit of array uh, formatting, gymnastics. But essentially, this is what happens. So in this line that is now highlighted, the policy gradient gets implemented. And all the action probabilities will be shifted a little bit. All the actions that were taken during high return trajectories, they will be uh, improved in their probability. Their probabilities will get increased more than the other actions. Okay. And that's it. So these are the important steps. We have uh, gone through the trajectories time step by time step, always applying the actions, getting the observations, telling, uh, having the neural network tell us what is the next probabilities and using these probabilities to generate randomly the next actions. And then we looked at it, we calculated the total return, so the sum of all rewards, and then we prepared everything to do this one final step that is the policy gradient update. Okay, and the rest is just a little bit of bookkeeping, keeping track of everything, um, nothing very special. Okay. So now let's, uh, let's try to do this actually. As you see, I, I'm using a batch size of 10, so always running 10 trajectories in parallel. I will initialize my neural network and um, I will now run 100 training steps. Each of these has already 10 trajectories and the number of time steps will be 20. This is of course arbitrary, but these are just my settings. The rest is a lot of bookkeeping that I don't even comment and let's just see what happens. Oops, it didn't go very high. 
Right now it went better. Okay. So here you see um, how the average reward um, evolves during training. So I have these 100 training epochs, each of which has 10 uh, trajectories. And we're starting from a rather low total reward or return on the order of two or three, which just means I randomly, during my random walk, I randomly am on this target side for two or three time steps. So it's nothing special. It's just what happens randomly. But then my reinforcement learning starts to understand what happens and the total return improves and improves and improves. And it's hard to improve uh, much more, actually. So let me now show you um, a typical trajectory as it was in the beginning of training. So this is one example. Oops, this is another example. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a typical trajectory. And uh, let me then show you a trajectory at the end of training. This is not yet perfect, but um, from knowing how this program works, I can tell you with great confidence that probably uh, site number nine, so this is position versus time, that site number nine <coughs> is probably the target site. And it has decided, oh, I should stay on this target. You see that it's not yet uh, completely perfect. If it were perfect, it wouldn't even rest on any side that is not the target side. It would just move straight in one line until it f finishes at the target side, and then it would forever stay on the target side. Yeah, so this is just a sampling of different uh, trajectories that one can look at. So we see that in a relatively modest number of trajectories, um, the, the policy gradient has automatically figured out the right strategy. And it really didn't know anything. The only input it has, well, this mysterious observed state, which is either a zero or one at each time step, but it, in the beginning it doesn't even know what this means. And the other feedback it gets is this total return, the sum of all rewards. Um, which we know, of course, is related to how long it stays on the target site. And we know that the target site is when the input is one, but the network doesn't know any of this in the beginning. Yeah? It finds out on its own by going in the direction of higher return and by applying this policy gradient technique. And so now you can imagine how powerful this is. Yeah? Because... Um, the concept is completely general. You apply this to any kind of input and uh, actions, um, and it will be yeah, it will be performing very well after some time. Okay. Are there any questions about this particular example right now? I mean, this is the most sophisticated example I, I am going to program for you. But of course, let's go back to the let's go back to the script, um, and let's move on to an example that maybe many of you have heard of, which uh, relies on essentially the same concept, but it uses much more computing power. <laughs> I have to confess, also some extra tricks. So um, the game of Go is simply a board game that two players play against one, uh, each other. Each player in each turn sets one of these stones. One player is white, the other is black. This is a board uh, of 19 by 19 sites. And in contrast to chess, there's only this one type of stone. Yeah? I mean, there's not different stones to distinguish. And your goal is also really simple. You want to encircle large areas of the board without them being encircled again by your opponent. You want to capture territory, so to speak. Yeah. Um, 
but you want to make sure that the opponent doesn't capture your own stones. So it's, it's a very funny game because you can, you can decide to have a strategy to be very modest, only trying to capture small areas, but then maybe the opponent uh, can also easily capture you inside these small areas. You can try to make uh, longer uh, lines, but then the opponent can easily uh, dis uh, disrupt these lines. So it's quite an interesting game. Um, and the number of moves is much, much larger than in chess, simply because the board uh, is so much larger. Yeah? And so therefore, um, for a long time it was thought that even though chess, uh, chess computers ha had been beating the world's best players since the 1990s, since the middle of the 1990s, uh, it was assumed that this uh, would be a long way off in the game of Go. Still, a neural network and reinforcement learning based program was able to beat the world's best player in 2017. And so the strategy is essentially policy gradient. So let's uh, go through this a little bit. So here I'm first explaining to you the first version of AlphaGo. There are multiple versions by now. In the first version, they first started to learn from human expert players. This is also quite interesting. So they were, there are large, large databases, obviously, uh, that contain many, many games played by human experts. And then you can analyze these games. And from looking at these games, you can say, okay, given this particular state, what did the human do? Yeah? Given this observation, what was the action that the human expert took? And then you apply something like reinforcement learning, but in the supervised manner, in order to update your policy. So here you see that you take steps based on the derivative of the logarithm of your policy, which will be encoded by a deep neural network, action given the state. But the funny thing is, instead of taking this out of one of your trajectories that you encounter during normal reinforcement learning that we just described, you take this out of this database of human games and the state is one of those states that wa was observed during one of those games and the action is actually the action that was taken not by the neural network but the action that was taken by the human expert. So if you do this long enough, you can show that the probability, the policy encoded by the neural network will try to match the average probability for the human experts to play this particular move. So this was the starting point. So not bad if you have such a large database. And this is of course a general scheme. You could apply this to anything where you have a large database where you have observed experts uh, doing moves in something. Yeah? You just need to record the states and the actions. But this was only the starting point. And then they really applied reinforcement learning. So they didn't have a human expert to play against because that would take too long because the humans cannot react so fast. But they really let different versions of the program play against each other. And then they really literally do the policy gradient. And so what you see here is a line that um, I found slightly mysterious when I first encountered this and didn't yet know about reinforcement learning, but which is now very, very familiar to all of you. So you see how to update the parameters here. They are not called theta, but rho. How to update the parameters of the neural network in such a way that you take the derivative the, of the logarithm of the probability and you multiply by the overall return. So what I call capital R is now called little z. And the little z is uh, de facto simply um, plus one if you won the game in the end or minus one otherwise. So that's very, very, very simple. The return is just based on whether you win the game. And then if you go through this, it gets better and better and better, uh, better than the original version that was only trained on the human expert moves. And so here's the situation displayed from the point of view of the neural network. The state, the observation, is simply the image of the board game with the black and the white stones. It's really literally just an image and you have as many neurons as there are um, positions on this grid, so 19 by 19. And then you get, go through a series of layers, so that's a deep neural network. And in the end, you also end up with something that has the dimensions of this board that looks like an image. 
but it's really the probability is to, take the vari to put a stone on the various sites. So for example, here you see that the probability on this particular site is largest as, as shown in this histogram style visualization. And so most likely, if you now take the next action, you will put the stone there. That doesn't happen all the time, of course, because there's a probability distribution and also with a smaller probability you could end up putting the stone somewhere else. So this is the policy network that you all know. Um, in this paper, I have to confess, they did a few extra tricks. Um, there's a value network. We will come to describe this uh, in a moment when we discuss other reinforcement learning methods. And also beyond the policy gradient type methods, they included another algorithm which is very popular for playing games for, for, as an algorithm for computers playing games. It's called Monte Carlo Tree Search. Essentially, it means a little bit that the computer simulates for itself a few possible games and then takes those stra that strategy that promises the biggest reward. So it's a little bit um, a mixture of this Monte Carlo Tree Search and the actual policy gradient. Okay, so that was AlphaGo. And actually, this um, game was already able to beat the best human player in the world. But they were not content with this. <laughs> so um, there's another version called AlphaGo Zero now, where the idea is you don't even start from any expert database. You start from scratch without any such database, without supervised learning. You only learn from self-plays, that is one version of the program plays against itself. And uh, what is plotted here is the, let's say, playing strength, so essentially something like the, number, the percentage of wins, if you like, um, versus the training time. And I should warn you that they trained on very special hardware that only they have access to. So, okay, so on, on your, uh, I read something that if you try to do the same on your typical GPU, powerful GPU that you might be able to buy for your home computer, then you would need 1,700 years, but okay, <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so what you see here is very interesting. So the, the pink line is supervised learning from the human expert moves. The dashed line is this um, alpha go that I described uh, previously that already was able to surpass this uh, expert moves and improve the, improve the strength a little bit. So that would be the dashed line. But then the blue line actually represents AlphaGo Zero. So that is training without learning from experts. And what they observed is highly interesting. So first of all, of course, it starts at a lower level and is not as good as the uh, supervised training from the human expert database, as you could imagine. It starts with a completely random network. It does completely stupid random moves. Yeah? So it's worse than a beginner. Then it becomes uh, gradually better and better and better. And then it seems to settle onto a level that is equivalent to what they had reached before. But then suddenly, after uh, about 40 hours of training, it makes a jump and becomes significantly better even in this level. And so now that is, so to speak, the strongest um, Go program on the planet. What this means is that by not looking at what the experts do in the beginning, even though you are slower in the beginning, you eventually get better. You invent something that is simply absent from the human expert moves. And it's not just a little improvement, uh, as the dashed line would be over this pink curve, but it's quite a substantial improvement. And so uh, that reminds us a little bit of what happens also with humans, because there are some stories of scientists that were autodidacts, yeah, that taught themselves, basically, and that were particularly creative later on, because somehow they were not tied so much to what the experts or the textbooks are telling us, uh, but then uh, if they can if they have enough patience and intelligence to reach a high level, then probably they can go even further on this basis. So that's very, very interesting. 
And so KG is one of these human uh, expert players and he had this statement which I found so uh, interesting. So after humanity spent thousands of years improving our tactics, computers tell us that humans are completely wrong. I would go as far as to say that not a single human has touched the edge of the truth of Go. And so this statement came after the experts observed that this AlphaGo Zero was uh, doing moves that uh, to a human looked completely crazy, but then it, it turned out that these were really very good moves, yeah. And they hadn't been discovered in this very long history of playing Go. Okay, so any questions about this? Well, if not, uh, let me move on. Um, so reinforcement learning is this large general concept that lets you discover new strategies only based on a reward. Policy gradient is one sort of uh, reinforcement learning and there are versions of it. And Q learning and versions of it is another big branch of reinforcement learning. So now I want to describe to you uh, what Q learning really means. So the Q here stands for quality and Q is called a quality function. So if I want to express it in words, I would say if you are in a given state and you want to figure out which action you should take, it would be good if someone could tell you, well, what's the best action, so to speak, and what, is, what determines what's the best action is what total reward do you expect if you take, if you were to take this particular action. So you have say four different actions. For each of those you ask, okay, uh, what is the total reward that I expect if I take this particular action. And then you can implement a very simple policy. If someone tells you the quality of these different moves, of course you pick the best move. Yeah? You pick the one with the highest quality fu function. Now this is all words and it's a little bit mysterious how, how would you know this quality function? How, is there someone who gives you this quality function or what? So, so this is what we want to discuss now. Okay, so here our little robot trying to move around. And the first concept I want to introduce, which is not yet the quality function, is a value function. So roughly speaking, the value function is a function of the state. So in this case, it would be a function of position. And it tells us how valuable it is to be on this particular position. So if I'm up there and my goal is to go and grab one of the boxes, that's not a very valuable site to be in. It's much better if I'm here because then I'm already very close to the box, obviously. Yeah? So uh, in such a situation, even qualitatively, even without seeing any definition, you could guess that the value somehow has to do with a distance to these good objects that I want to grab. So that would be a value function, which is also an interesting and uh, valuable concept. But now the quality function is a function not only of the state, but also of the action. And in this simple case, there are four actions, so going north, west, south, or east. So um, there are actually four different functions of position. And I only show one of them. I pick one action, let's say go up, and I show you the resulting quality function as a function of position. Yeah, so Q is a function of S and A. I fix A, it's still only a function of S, and S is the state, and in our case, that's the position. Okay. So now this tells us for each position how valuable would it be to go up. And obviously, if I'm just below the box and I go up, well, that's very valuable, that's the right thing to do. On the other hand, if I'm above the box and I go up, that's not so great. Yeah? Still, it may be slightly better than if I'm far away from the box because then I have to go many, many steps, whereas here it may be the wrong move to go up, but then I can quickly return, so it's not yet that bad. So you see here there's a certain asymmetry uh, as compared to the value function, but that's simply because we picked one of the actions. If I had picked the action going left, then the quality function would be maximum here because if I'm here and I move left, of course I win. Okay, so this is in, in pictures what the quality function will mean. But 
you want to have a definition and once you get the definition you want to know how to calculate it, how to obtain it. Okay. So let me introduce the definition. It's actually not difficult. Um, so the quality function is a function of state and action. And I say the quality function is the expected total return or sum of rewards given that I'm in this state presently and I'm taking this action. So conditioned on me being in this state and taking this action. What do I expect in terms of the sum of all rewards? Now, if I, take about if I talk about expectation values, I have to, I'm talking about probabilities, obviously, um, and I have to tell you what strategy am I following, yeah? Because this expectation value will depend on that strategy. And so here it becomes a little bit a cyclic definition, but uh, don't worry, uh, it will work out fine in the end. I'm assuming in calculating this expectation value that the trajectory that I will produce in the future follows my simple policy, which was to always pick the action with the largest Q. Yeah? So somehow the definition of Q is self-referential. It depends on Q itself. So I take the expectation value of my total return, assuming that I would pick this policy which always goes for the largest Q. Okay. So that may sound slightly mysterious at the moment, but don't worry. Uh, in the end, it will work out fine. So let's just take this as a definition. Now, what about this capital RT? That's not actually the total return for the full trajectory, including already all the rewards that I have picked up until now. It's only the return that I'm going, the total reward that I'm going to pick up starting from now. Yeah? I'm not interested in what happened in the past. I'm interested in what happened, what will happen in the future. Now, in principle, this capital RT could just be the sum of all the rewards, little r, from this time step to the end of the game. And that's a possibility. Yeah? So I could just add all the rewards from now until the end of the game. But people have found out that sometimes the algorithm um, finds it easier if you give more weight to the immediate rewards that will follow in the very next time steps and less weight to the rewards that come only very, very late in the game. Uh, the reason is simply that there's obviously a more direct connection between the next rewards and the next few steps and what I'm doing now rather than between what I'm doing now and what happens in a hundred time steps down the road. Yeah? So people implemented this by having something that's called a discounted future reward. So you introduce a parameter that's called little gamma. Little gamma is between zero and one, so typically a number less than one. And you add up all the rewards, but you multiply each of them with gamma raised to the power that is given by the total time that has elapsed from now until this time step t prime in the future. So the time steps that are further in the future have little gamma raised to a higher power, and since little gamma is less than one, this will uh, decrease the contribution. Yeah? So essentially it means you're looking for the short-term rewards, which is, if, if you are really doing this, uh, if you're taking this to an extreme, this would also call, be called a greedy algorithm. So you always would be doing the thing that gives you an instantaneous reward and don't worry about what comes later. Yeah. That's of course not so smart, but uh, here there's a com compromise, so to speak. Okay. But you can also, if you like, uh, get rid of this gamma factor and then the capital R is really just the sum of all rewards from now on until the end of the game. Here's a little uh, side remark. The value of a state would just be defined as taking the Q and maximizing overall actions. In other words, taking the expected reward for the optimal action. That would be called the value of the state. Okay, so now I've just introduced a definition and it would be obviously nice to have this Q because then you could always take the action with the largest Q. 
The question is how to get this Q, especially since this definition is somehow self-referential. Uh, you should take the optimal policy that in turn depends on the Q, so it's a little bit dangerous. And so now, there's something, so someone investigated this a long time ago, and there's something called the Bellman equation. And it looks really kind of funny, but if, you, if we go through it slowly, you will agree uh, with me that it's correct. So let's uh, maybe go back for a moment to this definition. Q was the expected overall return. Return was the sum of all the rewards from now to the end. Um, and now I'm, I will set up something that looks like a recursive equation, you know. So I will say the quality function at this state in this action is the expectation of what? Well, um, let me take the next reward that I would get if I pick the action with a maximum qu quality because that's my policy plus gamma, because we do this discounting, times and then the quality function already evaluated for the next time step and maximized over all actions. Because if you think about it, this will tell me what's the expected return at the next time step. Yeah? After I took this particular time step, already going to the next time step. So this is, so to speak, capital R from time t plus 1 to the end of time. I multiply by gamma and I add the little reward at this particular time and what I get is really nothing uh, but the total capital RT because that would be little RT at this particular time plus gamma times all the rest. So this is the trick. So somehow it's like as if you as if you write a series in the sense that you say the value of the series is the value of the first uh, number that I have in the series plus the rest of the series. So this is basically the idea. Okay, so um, given that I'm in the state and this action, uh, calculate the immediate reward plus gamma times the rest of the rewards, which can be represented in this way by the maximum Q function for the next step. Okay. So this is, if you think about it closely, this is a valid definition. This is self-consistent. This is the Q function. So to speak, just rewriting what we had on the previous slide. It makes it even more explicit in a sense that the definition of the Q function is uh, recursive, that it's self-referential, that in order to calculate the right-hand side, you actually somehow need to know already the left-hand side. Okay. So this doesn't yet help us in practice at first. So we cannot actually directly use this Bellman equation. But as always, if you want to solve an equation where the unknown quantity appears both on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, um, well, there are many possible ways to solving an equation, but one uh, approach is to, do, uh, to turn this equation into a kind of equation that has a fixed point. So sometimes um, it's good enough if you just start with a guess, then you calculate the right-hand side, you take it for the new value of the left-hand side, you insert it into the right-hand side, and you continue. For example, I believe if you have the equation x equals cosine x, you start with an arbitrary guess for x, you calculate cosine, you take this as your new x, you insert it again into the right-hand side, and so on, and so on, and so on. So on your pocket calculator, you just press cosine many, many times, and this will solve the equation, actually. So you start it from a more or less random guess, but you interpret it uh, as an equation that you have to iterate, and then you will end up with a fixed point. This doesn't always work, but uh, sometimes it works. Okay, and so that will be the strategy now. So we assume that we have already some kind of approximation to the Q function. I will call it Q old. This is, so to speak, what we have and we will update it. And now, what we essentially use is, so to speak, we, we plug in Q old into the right-hand side, and that will give us a Q new on the left-hand side. And to make this even more robust, 
we don't do literally what I just said, that we plug in our old guess in the right-hand side and use this to update the left-hand side, but we only go a little bit into this direction. That's more stable, yeah? You can also do this in general, to construct a fixed point equation out of an equation. So you take this naive iteration where you start with a guess, insert into the right-hand side, get a new value, insert into the right-hand side again, and so on. You take this and uh, augment it a little bit to only take small steps. So in total, what you get is the following. Um, what is shown here is essentially what is written down here, so to speak, the right-hand side. You subtract the old value of Q, that gives you a direction, something almost like a gradient in which to move. You multiply by a small factor because you don't want to move too far. You add that to the old value and that defines your new value. So in each step you move a little bit into the right direction. And now let me prove to you at least that the correct solution of the Bellman equation would be a fixed point. This is not difficult to prove because um, once your Q function fulfills this equation, left-hand side equals right-hand side, then this actually will be zero. And if it's zero, I don't change anything anymore, and then Q new will be equal to Q old. Yeah? And of course, we will also do this in a stochastic manner, so instead of taking an expectation value here, we will just sample uh, over, uh, over various uh, trajectories. So this is an update equation that is used uh, for the Q learning, uh, which essentially is set up in such a way that eventually it will converge to the correct solution of the Bellman equation. So, um, and that can be done, yeah, because on the right-hand side there's nothing which we don't know. There's just the um, old Q function before the update, then we take the update and we get a new function. So that's the update for the Bellman equation. Now you ask yourself, okay, but this Q function, how should I handle it? It's a function of both S and A. And again, maybe you only have a few states and a few actions, in which case Q can literally be a table. You make a little table. If there are three states and two actions, it's a three by two table, and that would be Q. Q is literally just a little array and you can then use this uh, Bellman equation. But um, more generally speaking, of course, your state will be something complicated, maybe again an image and the number of actions maybe is large, so then it's not feasible anymore to have a table. And in that case, again, one will use a neural network. So the neural network's purpose will be to calculate Q uh, given a, cert a set of states and actions. Okay. Is there any question about this? It's, yeah, please. There's some special way to define this Q so that we can ensure that we don't diverge from the stated point. But uh, convert on. Okay, good question. So basically the question is whether this always converges. Um, in all the examples I have seen it converges. I cannot... Um, proof to you immediately. I'm, I'm sure that in the literature there are proofs of convergence and I don't know whether it somehow always under reasonable assumptions uh, converges or whether there are examples where it, it has funny behavior. Yeah? But in the cases I've seen it just converges. Okay. This, uh, if you see uh, some problems, of course, you always have also the possibility to change this update factor. If you make it smaller, then of course everything goes slower, but it uh, is also likely that it becomes more stable. Okay. So now let me just illustrate this here a little bit. Um, here I again assume that I'm looking at the Q function, but since I want to visualize things, I fix the action. Let's say the action is going up and I only plot the Q function as a function of the state on this board. And the red side is the one I want to go to. It's a target side. This is where I get the reward. And mm, in the beginning, if I have, say, a walker that just randomly walks around, 
um, most of the time it doesn't get a reward, but if it's here, it gets a reward. And that means mm, it will learn that if it's on this side, directly below, then there is a reward. Then the Q function has a non-zero value. So that may be the starting point of my Q function, or after a few trajectories, this is wh where it will go to. And then the funny thing is, so, so that's quite easy. Yeah? If you are very close to the site that gives you a reward, it's obvious that you should get a Q function. But then using this update equation for the Bellman equation, what will happen is that the fact that this site has now been labeled as being good in terms of this Q function, also then it propagates the quality down to the other sites because now the algorithm will understand that also this side is pretty good because I'm, if I'm on this side and then I move up, I come to another side which is even better. Yeah? So somehow it's almost as if an infectious disease spreads out <laughs> from the good uh, target site. And so this can go on. And this is the way the Q function update works. So mm, at first you, are, you have to hit randomly on a reward. Then only the states next to the reward get a high Q function but then this spreads out also to other states because they are connected, so to speak. Okay, so I want to mention one thing. Um, initially, Q is arbitrary. We could set it to zero everywhere or to some random values, yeah. Um, it wouldn't be very smart to follow this Q, which is not yet the optimal Q at all, to follow this Q to define the policy because then you would just do crazy stuff because you try to maximize this Q, but this Q has no meaning actually. So what people do is they say at first we should rather randomly explore around. Yeah? So what then happens is that with some probability you do follow the Q. This is called exploitation. So you exploit the policy that you already have. And with another probability you do something completely random. This is called exploration because you explore the possible state space. And then uh, people like to introduce um, a number called epsilon that tells us uh, what's the probability to do this random move. And if you looked closely in the example I showed you, uh, I had a little bit of this epsilon uh, idea in there uh, with the, in the, even in the policy gradient. So I said maybe with some probability I, I could have random moves. So the idea here for the Q function would be initially you have a lot of this random exploration, but eventually uh, you reduce the epsilon so there's less of the random moves and more of the actual policy because that's the good thing to follow then. Okay. And so maybe I want to finish today with an example that was also quite spectacular. It came, about, uh, it came out in about 2013. So this is from the same team that later produced the AlphaGo. What they did is they took these very old computer games, video games, and they took as input to the neural network the whole screen as an image. And the output were different, uh, were the Q values for different actions. So I show it here. So the input is basically the, imp uh, the image. Then you have several convolutional layers. You know this by now. Eventually you have fully connected layers. And eventually you have an output um, that tells you uh, the Q function for different possible actions that you can take. Okay. And so this is what I, they applied to various computer games and now I want to switch and show you how this goes. You can find these movies yourself uh, on the web. So um, let me start from the beginning. So what you will see is the game of Breakout. This game just consists of um, having a pedal that the player can move around. There's a little ball that you have to bounce off the pedal. And then if the ball hits one of these colored bricks, it will remove the brick and the reward uh, will increase. So the high score increases. And so the high score is of course the actual reward that the reinforcement learning sees. 
And other than that, in the beginning, it does not know at all what the pixels on the screen mean. So for as far as the neural network is concerned, the input stream it is receiving is completely random stuff. Yeah? And also its outputs in the beginning are completely random. So now they display what happens during training. In the beginning, so this is already after a little bit of training, but often it loses the ball, so it's not at all that smart. So now they go on, there's more training. Now it has become better at least in hitting the ball, so it doesn't lose the ball so often anymore. Now it has become even better in this. It basically never loses the ball because it has learned to predict the trajectory essentially. And now something uh, amazing happens it has found a new good strategy. So you see, it basically it digs a tunnel here, here, and now if the ball goes uh, behind the bricks, it will automatically get a lot of points, yeah, simply because it is able to um, remove all of these bricks without ever having to hit the pedal again. And so you see how, how the score goes up, and so this is one of the games where they really scored better than human players. Okay. And so now, of course, you can try to analyze such a neural network. Um, this, uh, curiously enough, is a TSNE uh, visualization. We discussed this. So basically, what they are doing here is they take um, some of the neurons that define, so to speak, a point in a high dimensional space. And so for a given input image of the computer game, the neural network will of course be in a state with certain neuron values, with certain activations. Um, and then you get one point in a very high dimensional space. So to each image of the computer game, you assign one point in a very, very high dimensional space representing the state of the neural network. And now you want to visualize whether, the, whether some of these states are similar to each other and others are very different depending on the input image. And so they run what we uh, discussed, the TSNE visu visualization to project this down to low dimensions while keeping clustering intact and then they show uh, different examples. So when the neural network has states that are clustered together, also indeed the input images are similar and it will recognize them as being sort of similar value. So not only will it predict a similar Q function, yeah, but these are uh, states where it will probably take similar actions. Um, and the uh, color here, indicates the value of the state. So if the color is more to the red, these are very good states. So um, obviously states where it has just started and can still shoot down a lot of these enemy spaceships, uh, these are good states. But also states where it has gone very close to the uh, final um, without being destroyed, uh, these are also good states because it knows that very soon it will get a very good high score when it reaches the next level. So it has figured uh, these things out on its own, all on, all on its own. Okay, so um, maybe I want to mention already the homework uh, that in the next exercises you can do. And that is to try to find a treasure in a labyrinth. Now the labyrinth would look like this and maybe you define a random starting, a random starting point and a random place where you can pick up a treasure. Um, and then you want to have your reinforcement learning algorithm find the correct way through the labyrinth. And then there are many variations of this. Maybe you always have the same labyrinth. Okay, fine, this is one thing and then the state could be the location. Or maybe you want it to become good on arbitrary labyrinths. This is more challenging, then the state should be the full image that it has to observe. Yeah. And uh, you may ask yourself, how can you generate a labyrinth? But fortunately, there are uh, algorithms for doing this for you. So uh, you can go to Wikipedia and look at the maze generation algorithms. 
Well, so that's maybe enough for today. There are no further questions. Then we meet again on Wednesday. There's again exciting stuff coming up, and then we're going a little bit more into the direction of the connection with physics, spin models. Um, but until then, okay, see you.